I'm going to talk about uh, turning insight into action on the uh, TIBCO Fast Data Platform uh, using H2O, but uh, also using a stack of uh, TIBCO products. We are about a billion dollar company. We have three product areas in focus. Uh, data integration, uh, at rest, uh, web services, microservices, uh, analytics, where we have a few products, um, Spotfire, Jaspersoft, and so on. Uh, and then event processing, where we have uh, two products, um, uh, business events and, and stream base. And the idea of the fast data platform is to combine these so that we can take insights from uh, data at rest uh, as we look at data in uh, applications like, uh, like Spotfire uh, and also with, um, with H2O. Uh, and we've spent the last five years rewriting the R engine uh, to make that more performant. So that's embedded in the analytics products as well. So getting insights from visual analytics and predictive analytics and then taking those insights and putting them across to what we call the event server. And then as data comes in, uh, we, can, uh, we can score models, score rules against um, real-time data with the CEP products, and then take an action. And so it's this insight to action loop that we want to talk to you about today. Uh, we are focused a little bit on the left-hand side, the insight loop of this insight to action uh, with the H2O focus of this uh, presentation. Uh, but the, the goal is to take the insights and, and apply them in, in uh, real time. So we've got three demos. It's kind of ambitious. We're trying to get through three demos today. Um, we have one uh, It's kind of focused on manufacturing. Uh, we work across industries. Actually, we're biggest in uh, finance uh, and retail. Um, but today, we're looking at manufacturing. Uh, the first example is around hard drives. And uh, to make a hard drive, there's several thousand components that have to be manufactured and put together. Uh, and, uh, and typically our customers in this area, you know, have, uh, when there's an issue, like a drop in the, uh, in the yield, uh, in this case where this was a major problem, uh, yield dropped in half and production got reduced from 70,000 to 3,000 drives in that week uh, at this particular facility. Um, uh, and so getting into a machine learning approach to understand what are the factors that are affecting that um, you know, we're big fans of gradient boosting, and so we use that um, typically. In this case, we're running that from Spotfire and, and finding the, um, you know, the variables that are important in affecting uh, that drop, and importantly, the, uh, the interactions um, as these parts are kind of put together, uh, the two-way interactions are important. Um, and then taking those uh, learnings and applying those into the stream-based product so that as uh, data are coming through, uh, from subsequent uh, manufacturing and assembly uh, processes, we can uh, score the model against certain thresholds um, as we refresh the data and send out notifications to the appropriate engineers to take some kind of an action. Um, and in this case, that was a pretty expensive uh, error that, uh, or issue that occurred, and we were able to generate some ROI to pay for the investment in this work. The um, second example is uh, in solar cell manufacturing, um, you know, wafer type manufacturing where um, typically up around a, a million wafers per day are being produced across a bunch of different controllers and we use Spotfire to find the issues uh, and then uh, you know, figure out what to do with those uh, issues when there's a drop like this, uh, understand the hotspots, uh, capture those in, uh, in some kind of a, a model and uh, basically understand how to uh, uh, then trap those uh, in real time with uh, um, threshold violations across equipment parameters like temperature, pressure, resistivity to send uh, alarms out to, um, you know, for intervention. Uh, and so in all these cases, you've got, uh, you know, one thread is, is a yield quality issue. Um, so in the hard drive example, there's lots of components in the assembly process uh, and you need rapid interactive visualization, um, estimating effects and interactions. And then on the machine management side, lots of columns. Both of these uh, data um, problems have lots of columns. Um, you know, 1,000 sensors and 1,000 readings per sensor uh, produces a bunch of columns. Um, so you need to rapidly uh, inter interactively visualize the data and then estimate the effects and the interactions uh, and then uh, score that in, in real time on fast uh, data. So we're going to jump into a couple of demos around interactive viz on, uh, on yield. Um, in this case, on the, uh, on the wafer map uh, problem, uh, and then understand where those issues might be, um, what the patterns are of the, uh, of the defect or yield, uh, and then uh, fit a machine learning model uh, like a, 
Uh, a GVM, again, is our sort of favorite. It seems to do the, do the job um, better than most. Uh, and then understand the variable importance and the interactions in particular uh, to you know, figure out uh, the detail around that and how to understand um, what are the factors driving the, the problem. Uh, the third example we're going to show from uh, one of our customers, uh, Occidental Petroleum, just presented this at one of our user conferences. Uh, and they're using the combination of Spotfire and Streambase to uh, monitor all of their wells, about 2,500 uh, wells producing in the US and uh, Middle East. Uh, so um, doing surveillance on electrical parameters, downhole pressures, temperatures, surface pressures, uh, again, to prevent failures and extend the equipment life so by uh, two uh, components there uh, to enhance production. And the idea here is uh, you know, reading in the sensor data into Spotfire, navigating to the issue, um, you know, finding that particular com uh, issue and, uh, uh, and then drilling into that in more detail to look at what, was the what were the leading indicators of that issue and then set up some uh, control charts to, uh, uh, for uh, when uh, the real-time data is coming through to have something to threshold uh, those against and make an intervention. Um, you know, back test this to get the appropriate uh, thresholds and uh, and, and then set that up in the, in the real-time system so that as data are flowing through Streambase, we can constantly monitor against those thresholds uh, and produce a, uh, an intervention when uh, the thresholds are violated. So that's the concept of the fast data platform, is taking uh, insights from uh, visual and predictive analytics on data at rest and applying those to uh, data in motion through CP systems. Uh, and the... Uh, you know, we're going to show you today some examples of, of uh, machine learning models, uh, but uh, it, sometimes the uh, rules that you're monitoring by can be very simple, uh, location change or slope change or, or uh, a control chart sort of excursion, that sort of thing in addition to a, uh, to a machine learning model. Okay, so there's three uh, demos we're going to try and uh, give here. Um, and uh, Anna uh, Nowakowska is here. She's uh, doing a, a lot of this work. Um, we're going to try and uh, give you a manufacturing uh, demo, um, a uh, Hadoop example uh, where we use both H2O and uh, TIBCO's R, and this energy surveillance example. They're going to three demos that we're going to try and give. Um, I did mention, I wanted to uh, just read first, for us, you know, we've spent the last five years rewriting R, uh, and so we now have a uh, scalable implementation of R that's embedded in our products, uh, Spotfire Streambase, for example. Uh, we rebuilt this at a very low level uh, for, to improve performance on, and run on big data. It installs with many of our products. Um, there's a developer edition that's available if you just want to use that. Um, and it supports the, uh, the CRAN type packages. Uh, and you know, performance compared to open source R, it's about um, 10 times faster for fitting models and about 100 times faster for, uh, for scoring uh, models. And we're going to use this along with H2O in, in uh, the examples in some of the machine learning fits. Uh, this uh, TIBCO R engine uh, installs with Spotfire, and you can test locally. Uh, but then you can also run this against uh, uh, close to the database on the server side um, by loading data directly into that engine and then communicating back and forth uh, with Spotfire, for example. Uh, and this supports any type of back and forth, uh, rows, columns, blobs, uh, geospatial uh, objects, that sort of thing. So it's um, a pretty full function, fully functional um, integration between uh, TIBCO R and the rest of the TIBCO stack. Uh, and we will touch on uh, the integration of the TIBCO R uh, and, Hadoop, and H2O into a uh, Hadoop and Spark environment. We, we did win the Best in Show Award at the Strata Conference last year for, for this. And it's uh, a, a tear uh, on, the, on, the, on the nodes. Um, H2O uh, also available through a Spotfire interface. This is point and click to run these uh, sorts of jobs uh, on uh, Hadoop or Spark. Uh, and there's some of the places where we've Im Im uh, implemented the TIBCO R engine. So with that, uh, let's jump out and do a couple of demonstrations mm -hmm. and introduce uh, Anna to uh, start off the demonstrations. Yeah, hi, okay, the microphone works, that's good. So let me switch to here. All right, so uh, now we are in the Spotfire environment, and the first demonstration we're going to look at is uh, what we'll try to do here is understand causes of silicon wafer yield loss caused by product fails. So for, first we'll do some exploratory data analysis in Spotfire, and then we will fit a GBM model uh, to understand um, variables that are most predictive of failures. So um, first, 
yeah, as I said, some exploratory data analysis. What we're looking at here is, uh, it's not refreshing. Yeah, what we're looking at here is um, historical yield data. So in this line chart here, um, we see yields for um, lots of wafers. And we can drill down to the data and see um, what happened. On the y-axis, you see the yield. So it's between 60 and 80%. So uh, let me select this lot, um, these four lots here with a relatively low yield. Uh, we want to see you know, uh, what, what happened there. So um, in the box plot, we see the distribution for each lot, the distribution of yields. And then um, in the bottom bar graph, we see for each of these lots uh, which tests were mostly failing. So we see for each of them, test one, which might be like a high pressure test, um, is often failed. And then in the bottom uh, right, we see a custom map chart. It's an example of a custom map chart in Spotfire where we can look at um, wafers for each lot superimposed on top of each other and see where, uh, where we had most failures. Now in this view here, we can actually look at each wafer individually um, to look at the failures. And these are fully interactive charts. Uh, so now that we've looked um, at the data visually, uh, what we want to do is fit a model and see if we can predict uh, failures based on sensor readings. So in this page here, uh, we set this up so that uh, we have a list of all the variables available in the data. And uh, we can set them, uh, we can choose which ones we want to use as predictors and then choose a response as well. So in this case, we selected all the numeric uh, sensor readings as predictors and uh, the yield loss variable as a response. Uh, now, what we can do is, in this interface is um, run two models. We set this up so we, that we can run one um, in TER, so the typical enterprise runtime for R, and the other one in H2O. So uh, just like you can trigger H2O jobs from R, you can do it exactly in the same way from TER. It, lo it works exactly the same. And uh, I'm not going to rerun it now. It takes about, it's a small data set, but it still takes about um, two minutes to run these two models, but you can see um, the fits from both are comparable. Now, in the results page, uh, both H2O and TER report on variable importance. Um, now, what we, what we really like about um, the R GBM implementation is that it, additionally, it also reports on interactions between variables. So I can look at any pair of variables and in this tree map on the bottom, I'll see the interactions between them as well as partial influence plots here on the bottom. So um, this is definitely something that we would love to see in H2O in the future. So you know, H2O um, results in very good models and run really fast and we would love to have some of these additional outputs in H2O as well, like we have now in R and TER. Um, anything you would like to add on this particular demonstration? No, I mean, it's obviously a whirlwind tour through this. Um, you've got uh, sensors on the equipment that you can uh, model in this way. You've also got the yield process and the output of the product that you can model in this way. So oftentimes we'll get into a machine learning exercise for both the sensors of the equipment as well as the yield. Um, and so we've shown you kind of a bit of a mixed bag here, but um, this is a sampling of kind of the things we do in, uh, in the high-tech manufacturing space. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to the other example. Okay, sure. Uh, so in this other, this other example, uh, we would like to now show you how Ter um, can work on top of Hadoop. And uh, we'll, again, fit both Ter models and H2O models on top of Hadoop. So um, what we have here is a preview of the data. Um, so the data set is, um, it's a data set for a fictitious retail company and each row in the data is a shipment and for each shipment uh, we are tracking the volume of the shipment and the value of the shipment and then uh, how much of it was lost or stolen on the way and what was the value that was lost or stolen on the way. So um, 
this particular retailer has a problem that a lot of shipments go missing and they want to find out uh, what is causing this and whether um, you know whether the missing shipments can be predicted by for example the value of um, of the shipment in the beginning um, so this is the, what we're looking at here is a preview of the data in Spotfire that we brought into memory uh, the entire data set is 10,000 million rows on a three node Hadoop cluster um, now in this view I just want to briefly talk about uh, the different uh, options of bringing data into Spotfire so the first option is bringing data into memory uh, but obviously for a 10 million raw data set you wouldn't want to do that so we have uh, other options as well so um, you can bring data on demand so for example here I can select uh, one site from the any site from the data and it will just bring me the raw level data for that site uh, that's called data on demand or yet another option is in database aggregations uh, so what I can do is um, aggregate the data um, in database and only bring the aggregates here. So you'll see these visualizations um, work on the aggregate data. It's, you know, I'm working with the entire data set on Hadoop, uh, but it's really fast because I'm only bringing the aggregated data that I need for the visualization. Um, okay. So now that we know a little bit about the data set, um, let's get to the actual modeling. So we uh, will show two options in this example. So first we will um, run a MapReduce model through Ter. Uh, so we have Ter installed on each of the three nodes uh, of the Hadoop cluster. Do you wanna? Five minutes, yeah. Five nodes? Five minutes. Oh, five, okay. And um, uh, we, we can run a MapReduce job. So what this interface uh, that we set up lets us do is um, select is the map, um, the keys in the data, and then the values in the data and specify the job and run it on top of Hadoop. Um, yeah, I'm, again, I'm not in the interest of time, I'm not gonna run it. And we can bring results back. Um, so what we're doing here is fitting a model uh, for a combi each combination of site and country, and uh, we're trying to see where shipments are being lost. And now that we have the results back, we can explore um, relationships uh, between coefficients in the fitted model. So that's one approach: running uh, several, you know, running a number um, of models for each combination of. Um, of country and site. And another um, approach is a, the HRO approach where you can run a one big model on top of the entire data set. Um, so this is what we have implemented here. Um, first, we can do some data exploration and uh, look at the relationship between the different variables before actually running the model. And then, um, we made this interface for specifying the H2O model and then running it on top of Hadoop. And what we get is a one model rather than a number um, of different models. So, um, and uh, as when you get the results, we can explore the re residual distribution um, or fitted versus actuals. So just kind of an example um, of how we can fire up an H2O job from Ter on top of Hadoop from Spotfire. Okay. Great, great. So let's, um, let's just fire up the last demo and see if we can uh, just quickly uh, show this one. Uh, I wanted to just complete the loop into uh, Streambase with one of these models. And uh, we're going to take the, uh, actually a, a third uh, Spotfire analysis um, of these pumps. And this is a remote surveillance of these pumps. Uh, we can uh, look into a certain set of wells where we've um, had some failures. Um, we can see the failures here. The, straight, the traces here, pressure in blue, current in uh, green. Um, as we select those wells with, uh, with failures, uh, we can uh, you know, see um, the failures and we can go backwards in time. If we normalize the failures across multiple wells, look backwards in time, look at the patterns leading up to the failures. In this case, pressure going up, current going down. Uh, we can start to calculate um, you know, uh, 
rules or models. The, the, uh, this is a pump here that's had repeated failures. You know, I can look at uh, calculating, say, a, a slope of these values um, um, and find the his, in the historical data this slope that maximizes the true positive rate for a certain um, uh, true negative rate. And then once I have this uh, value, I can send it across to Streambase and then monitor uh, you know, off of that. So I'm going to start up a Streambase process here. It's already started? It's already started. I started. Oh, cool. OK. Um, so this is a stream-based process. I've sent thresholds across from Spotfire. I'm now monitoring sensor data in real time with a variety of um, you know, real-time math calculations. Uh, I'm going to launch uh, a live uh, view onto this. Uh, we've got a live data mart underneath this that you can manage a cache of data as it's coming through. Um, I think we've got a simulated sort of 12-hour cache that we're managing here. Uh, I've started to get um, some uh, emails here because as this threshold is hit, I'm going to fire off a uh, a pre-configured uh, Spotify root cause analysis. Uh, so if I click here, uh, I've got an email that's shown up. Um, and uh, let's see, um, it's probably this one, is it? Uh, no, it's on the top of the? Mm -hmm, on the top. On the top, OK. <laughs> Sorry, this is not my computer. Um, uh, so yeah, this is just fired off here. I can see the pressure's gone up, you know, current's gone down. Um, I can drill into a more contextual um, analysis that's been saved on the Spotify server. Um, and uh, basically, the um, intuition or the uh, rule that I, or model that I developed in Spotfire in the first place has now been uh, applied to real-time data. And when there's a violation, it sends an email. You, know, you can bring up the context around it. You know, here's this well was going along quite nicely. And then all of a sudden, we got this spike in pressure and current. We're able to see where that occurred. Um, so that's the kind of notification that you can set off from, uh, you know, from Streambase here uh, you know, in a, a Spotfire job. Uh, and then this is the live, uh, live data mart, a view onto the live data mart, uh, where we can see when uh, one of those wells has that um, violation of, of, uh, of pressure and current, uh, we're getting a view onto that, and we're seeing that in, you know, in motion. Um, so let me jump back to the slides. Uh, OK, you got a keystroke for that. OK, OK. Um, so we tried to show you those three demonstrations of uh, manufacturing, high-tech manufacturing process, uh, running a Hadoop or Spark type jobs from a Spotfire interface with um, uh, the machine learning occurring either on TIPCO R or, or H2O. So that's the insight part of this. Um, and then the action part of it is the stream base where we can push uh, a TIPCO R model across the stream base for real-time scoring or a set of rules that we identify in Spotfire. We can score those in real time. Um, and you know we've we've focused today on on manufacturing, uh, but this you know this is the this is the core of the company, uh, the fast data platform combining our data integration, our analytics and our CEP products together, uh, and we do this type of thing in all kinds of industries: customer service, making offers, um, predictive maintenance, inventory, pricing optimization, fraud, rerouting transportation. You know we run a lot of uh, we started in Wall Street, but we run things like we run FedEx, we run a lot of the airlines, uh, trains, and so on with. Uh, with this type of a, a platform. Uh, so very uh, abbreviated presentation today, uh, but there's a couple of talking points and questions that we could take you know, from the audience. We really like H2O. Um, we obviously really like our own uh, R, TIBCO R as well. Um, you know, H2O is fast. Um, where's the questions? We've got to leave that up for the questions, unfortunately. Uh, we've got to put that slide back up, because that's the question stuff. Um, and so, uh, you know, H2O, we, we, we'd love there to be some uh, additional stuff that we're able to get in R, like uh, the optimal number of trees, the variable interactions, um, you know, continuous inputs, and so on. GBM, again, is our favorite model. Um, but we see both uh, TIBCO R and H2O as having a real big role to play on the insight part of this uh, insight to action loop. Um, and then there's a few comments that we've uh, uh, throw it open for questions, but we've, uh, you know, in our experience in working with Spark and, and, and uh, TIBCO R and, and H2O, we've got a few learnings from that as well. But yes, yeah, a question. So one of the demos mentioned um, H2O on Hive. Um, as far as I remember, H2O cannot directly connect to Hive. So um, how, did, how did you guys um, make that work? Um, so basically what we did there uh, is we just, we moved the data from Hive to H2O and then the models were run on the data in H2O rather than directly on Hive. So that, that was just moving, data movement, and the data movement happened through TER, so through that typical runtime R. 
what's the uh, predictive model that you're used for your time series data? The time series data? Which time series data? What's the predictive model you are using for, uh, for this, uh, your data, the streaming data? Uh, so the, we, we mainly focused on gradient, I can't quite understand the question. We mainly focused on gradient boosting today. Um, I think the, the question is about the last demo. Oh, the last demo was an excursion outside of control limits. So we had a slide showing the control limits we put in place for, uh, for the sensor data. And so excursion, when the pressure slope uh, exceeded the, uh, the limit that we back tested historical data, and, and the current uh, also in the opposite direction, the slope, which is being calculated on a sliding window, when that exceeded the threshold that we calculated on the historical data. So it's anomaly detection in that case. Oh, OK. So there's no prediction. Um, yeah, there's a prediction. Uh, so what is the prediction model that you're using? What is the algorithms you're using? It's a control chart. Um, you know, I put this slide up uh, here. Uh, so the, the last, uh, the, the, first two, um, the first two examples, we used a GBM, uh, a, a failure model. The last example, we used a control chart. So there was a dual, uh, two-variable control chart on pressure and current that we uh, back-tested uh, on historical data to get the limits, uh, you know, to maximize true positive rate against a, uh, a, a given uh, true negative rate. So how you define the threshold? Uh, well, I actually went through that, but um, in the, the design of this, you, you, uh, you look at the, an anomaly, um, you know, or you look at multiple anomalies, and then you look at the leading indicators leading up to the anomaly, uh, and then you uh, come up with a, uh, a, a threshold that you then back test against historical data uh, to find the limits of the threshold. Uh, okay. That's all the time we have for. Thanks a lot, Mike and Nana. Thanks, everybody. Thank Warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.